We're here with Dr. Craig Evans, internationally known and respected scholar, New Testament distinguished professor, Acadia University Divinity College, Woodfield, Nova Scotia, a great friend at Crossroads. You know, Dr. Evans, you've been invited by the Vatican to come to Rome along with scholars throughout the world. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's exciting. Mm. A lot of people know this, of course, that Pope Benedict XVI is himself a brilliant scholar. Right. Excellent theologian. He's been writing in recent years books on the historical Jesus. And so it's, it's, the, these books are critically acclaimed, well known. There was a, a review of them a couple years ago. I was privileged to be part of that, carried by dozens of media outlets around the world, hundreds of stories written up about his books on Jesus. They're profoundly insightful. And so what's happened is the Vatican has invited a number of scholars, most of whom are Roman Catholic, but just a few of us are Protestants. And, and I'm, I'm really honored and pleased to be one of those Protestants to be invited to Rome in October of this year to talk about the Pope's book and explore the very important teaching the New Testament has about Jesus. It's what we call Christology, but we're interested in Jesus of history and we're interested, in, of course, in his ongoing uh, intercessory role, uh, you know, the second person of the Trinity. So all of that in its, in its theological depth, but also with its historical interests and background and, and uh, the past, all of that is being explored. I look forward to it. I know it'll be an outstanding event. You know, we all remember Josh McDowell's evidence that man's a verdict, but I think you've done something amazing for Crossroads in that you have written a popular book under Crossroads Publishing and it's about the Bible, the Bible and you, God's story of love and transformation, where you've taken these really tough topics that, you know, are doctoral level, that you've got to be a theologian to kind of understand, and you've just translated them to every man's language. People can understand them. This is the perfect book for someone to get to share with a friend and to, to explain the redemptive message. What motivated you to do it? Well, I was highly motivated to write this book, and I've been thinking about writing uh, that book or a book like it for a long time, because I'm very concerned about the lack of Bible knowledge in our society today. It used to be, when I, when I, was, when I was a child growing up, everybody, everybody knew the basic Bible story. Whether they went to church or not, it was just part of the mainstream of our culture. That's gone. That's changed a lot. And not only has uh, mainstream culture become ignorant of the Bible, what it is and what it says, but even people in the church don't know it as well as they should. And so, Jerry, I, I just, I had a real burden to do something about that. And Crossroads gave me the opportunity to, to do something about it and squeeze it into a pretty busy schedule and write this book. And I'm, and I'm so pleased that it's available now and that, that it is being promoted uh, through the Crossroads programming and people are being made uh, aware of it. And I, and I hope a lot of people get it, read it, and give it to friends uh, and family members who they need to know the Bible story. They have misconceptions about it. They don't know what the Bible really says. They really don't know what the book is. And uh, my book uh, speaks to that. Well, there's two things I think we could say that professors at Harvard, Yale, all the Ivy League schools have said that a student cannot properly be educated without an understanding of the basic concepts of the Bible in arts, literature, <laughs> why? Yeah, that is very true because... That's a profound thing. Well, the, uh, you know, the Bible has impacted the Western world, especially the whole world, but especially the West, hugely. And the way we speak, our points of reference, our understanding of morality and ethics, our understanding of law, human rights, egalitarian pr principles, compassion for the poor, the weak, and the sick, and all these things, our concern in the West for education, uh, the advancement of science... A lot of people don't realize that. They think, oh, well, if you, you know, if you take the Bible seriously, you must not be interested in science. Far from it. Uh, <clears throat> biblical teaching has promoted the quest for knowledge. It has promoted the idea that, you know what, the world is a beautiful place. It's worth studying. There, in fact, is order. It is possible to be scientific. There are laws of science because God is an ordered being. He is an intelligent, loving being. He has put together something that's not chaotic, but something that's beautifully constructed, and we are benefited by our understanding of our world, and we are encouraged to study it. So these are, these are the kinds of things 
that the Bible imparted to our cultural heritage. And it's, for me, it's, it's a tragedy if this generation turns its back on the Bible's message, quits listening to it, becomes ignorant, that will hurt us all. It will have serious negative consequences for our generation and for generations to come. Now, Dr. Evans, when the, many of the biblical media programs are produced, there's a Dominic Crossan, Bart Ehrman, who pedestals up and wants to immediately tell us that Jesus was married or this didn't mean what it meant. Why is the media so biased to quote these liberal skeptics when we have scholars like you who can stand toe to toe with them and challenge them? You debated Bart Ehrman many times. Well, yeah, that's a good observation, Jerry. And of course, there is, I think, a bias in media to, to whatever you want to call it, to tilt in a certain direction. Uh, part of it is uh, media and the news media, especially, they're looking for something that's new. And the old story, the old traditional understanding isn't new. So they want something hot, something edgy. So the idea, well, you know, sure. maybe Je Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, or maybe they had kids, or you know what, there were other gospels uh, that Emperor Constantine <clears throat> pushed out of the Bible. You know, this stuff, of course, is just nonsense. But I can see why a media with a bit of a leftward tilt or a little bit of an anti-church orientation would, would seize on that and think, wow, some professor, some guy with a PhD, he's come up with this whole new theory and they jump all over it and run with it. However, I want to be fair to the media. They, they do ask me to participate also. So sometimes it's almost like a tug of war. So yeah, you know, and I, I'm good friends. <laughs> you know, you mentioned some people, you know, like Dom Crossan and Bart Ehrman. There could be some others that I could mention. I'm, I'm friends with them. But the Jesus Seminar got so much hype. Of course. And at the same time, there were reliable scholars internationally that could dismantle the basic tenets that the media never did about the Jesus Seminar uh, road show, shall yeah, we say. Yeah, that's right. And you know, <clears throat> uh, ABC News uh, and uh, Peter Jennings, uh, a Canadian journalist, by the way, yeah. who was well known in the United States for many years, a very fine person, but he was misled, I think, by the Jesus Seminar, and he thought it was it represented mainstream scholarship. So it got far more press than it ever should have. It's actually a very eccentric uh, scholarship, and the real mainstream, you'll be happy to know, scholars who are in Britain, not just in America, not just in certain circles, but in Britain, in, in Germany, in, throughout Europe, they were laughing at what the Jesus Seminar was doing. And, and these are my friends too. And so, you know, there is a solid body of scholarship that, that comes to this conclusion. One, the gospels do reliably tell us about Jesus. We actually do know what he taught. We know what he did. And we know that his disciples understood that and communicated accurately and truthfully what Jesus said and did and so forth. And so this idea, this quirky, uh, edgy scholarship about Jesus, you know, we, you know, the gospels really don't tell the truth <laughs> or we don't know what he really taught or, you know, maybe he had a wife and that kind of thing. That is not mainstream at all. That's the, that's what the media, I think the news media especially need to understand. That's not mainstream scholarship. That's a quirky, eccentric, uh, in some cases, pseudo scholarship, but the heavy hitters, the people elsewhere in North America and in, in Europe, the heavy hitters, the people who belong to the elite academic societies, and very few of them are Jesus Seminar guys, the <laughs> elites, they laugh at that stuff and they're mainstream and they have a, a pretty optimistic attitude uh, toward the gospels. Hey, you know, they're good sources. You wanna know what Jesus says. You, you know, you go to the New Testament gospels. You don't go to second, third century uh, Gnostic writings and this other stuff. Well, we're talking about the book, The Bible and You, God's Story of Love and Transformation. It's available for your special gift to Crossroads Ministry, and it's a Crossroads publishing product. This is an essential handbook for every Christian to have. Now, let's drill down. So the Bible was recorded like a letter, and then it, many recordings of that. Uh, from that point to 1455 and the invention of the, of the press that we've seen there in Germany, how did we preserve the biblical record? 
Well, there, there were tens of thousands of copies made of the Bible down through the years. Book by book, letter by letter, Paul's letters, the Gospels, the book of Acts, the book of Hebrews, the book of Revelation, and so on. Usually individually, sometimes in clusters, copied, copied, copied. After a scribe copied it, a proofreader would read it. If he noticed that the scribe made some slips, he'd make corrections. That's how it was done. Well, we take these thousands of manuscripts that have survived, of, of the many thousands of, of the original copies, we compare them. And we say, yep, that's, that's the right word. That's what Paul said. Yep, that's what Matthew the evangelist wrote. And we can determine that. So when you take a modern Greek New Testament on which our English Bible translations today are based and you look at it, you're looking at the original text. Once in a while, we're not sure about this word or that word, but those uncertainties are almost always very, very minor even almost, you could say, trivial. So we really do know what the biblical text says. The Old Testament Hebrew, the New Testament Greek. There really is no reason for the kind of skepticism you sometimes see uh, expressed in the popular media. Well, we've got just a minute or so, and I want to just remind our viewers that Bible literacy is, is at an all-time high. And if we don't recover the Bible, we could lose culture. And we see that in Paradise Lost. Oh, you're absolutely right, Jerry, and that's, that's ultimately is my big concern about this book. I am so concerned about, about the declining knowledge today about what the Bible's all about, and with it, the morality, the ethics, and worldview. I hope my book helps turn that around. We're so thrilled to have you, Dr. Evans, joining us this month. The book is entitled, The Bible and You. God's story of love and transformation and within its covers are so many essential truths that a renowned scholar has made understandable for every one of us. I hope you'll get a copy and share it with your friends.